Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. The Industrial Revolution brought significant advancements to Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries, including chemical manufacturing, the steam engine, and machine tools, what we would call power tools today. As new industries rose, existing industries were also upgraded. One of the most significant, and the oldest, was beer. The actual method of brewing and storing beer hadn't changed much over the past few hundred years. But as with any period of change, competition bred growth. Literally. London breweries started building their own cisterns and vats larger and larger. Capacities quickly grew from 2,400 barrels worth of beer all the way up to nearly 10 times that amount, large enough for one craft brewery to actually host a dinner party for 100 guests inside a single empty vat. Of course, revolutions don't just happen. They're built up over long periods of trial and error, and when you're racing competitors to build the largest beer vats in the city, errors are bound to crop up. It was a Monday evening in October in 1814 when it happened. A leak had sprung at the Henry Moe and Company Brewery in central London. Well, leak might be an understatement. A vat holding 3,500 barrels, or 135,000 liters of beer, burst wide open. The deluge was so powerful that it also knocked over a number of casks of porter, resulting in an ocean of ale totaling over 1.47 million liters. The flood ripped through one of the brewery's 25-foot brick walls like it was paper and collapsed part of the roof. Streets became rivers and nearby houses were obliterated. On the first floor of one such house, a mother and her young daughter were at tea when a wave of beer swept them away, killing them instantly. Others in the vicinity were carried off in the flood or crushed to death by debris. One major problem contributing to the higher death toll and complicated rescue efforts was the town's flatness, which prevented the beer from draining away. Instead, it simply poured into basements and washed out roadways. The current of the flood was so strong that it dragged debris from the homes it had destroyed, which created obstacles for rescuers trying to reach their victims. By the time rescuers were able to reach the areas hit the hardest, it was already too late. Bodies began floating up from the ruins around midnight, including that of a woman who had been in her backyard at the time and had been buried under the rack of her home. All told, eight people perished in the flood. As you should know by now, the story doesn't end there. A week after the disaster, the brewery was taken to court to determine the cause of the accident. A brewery employee by the name of George Crick came forward with his account of what had caused the flood. George had noticed one of the iron hoops holding the vat together had fallen off. I know what you're thinking. Why didn't George just pick the hoop back up and grab some tools and put it right back where it belonged, right? Well, these weren't the usual metal hoops you might find around pickle barrels. Each of these weighed roughly one metric ton. George and the owners had determined that the rivets holding the hoop to the barrel had simply worn out over time. And like the button on a pair of pants two sizes too small, they popped out. The weight of the liquid inside proved too much for the vat to handle, and the rest, as they say, is history. History, but also a tragedy. Lives were lost, homes were destroyed, businesses were closed, and most tragic of all, even though the accident was a product of human error, the brewery got off without a hitch. In fact, a year later, they managed to get the crown to give them back the tax money they'd paid on the lost beer. The court might have called it an act of God. But looking back, I think a larger, more universal truth needs pointed out, however obvious it might be. Some people just can't hold their liquor. They say necessity is the mother of invention. When spears weren't enough to stop an enemy, bows and arrows were created. 
When those outlived their usefulness, along came guns and rifles to get the job done. War transformed as weapons advanced. But one thing never changed. The ingenuity of desperate men faced with impossible odds. That ingenuity was on full display during the American Civil War, when battles weren't just fought in fields and towns, but along coastlines and rivers. These waterways were used to transport supplies, ammunition, and even soldiers from one location to another. An army controlling the water could cripple the opposing forces' access to necessary items, such as food and medical equipment. The water was also used as a venue for surprise attacks. Soldiers marching near an enemy-controlled waterway would often find themselves ambushed by waiting gunboats. Rivers and coastlines quickly became a crucial part of an army's strategy, and if an enemy wanted a chance at survival, it had to either avoid the water entirely or use it to its advantage. It was at the height of the Civil War when such an advantage presented itself. A Union blockade had been stationed in the waters off Charleston, South Carolina, led by a steam-powered sloop of war known as the Housatonic. Armed with a dozen cannons, the Housatonic was known for capturing Confederate ships, like the 400-ton iron-hulled steamer the SS Georgiana. The Confederacy needed to break up the blockade to open up Charleston's shores, but to do so, the Housatonic had to go. There was only one problem. The ship was five miles off the coast. Any opposing vessel launched from the shore would be seen immediately and destroyed. So the Confederate Army had an outrageous idea. What if they attacked it from below? It took them two years of trial and error, but a submersible was finally developed that could carry eight men. They would travel beneath the water to the Housatonic, where the men would detonate a torpedo along the enemy's hull. Something to keep in mind, though. Unlike our modern torpedoes that propel themselves through the water, the Hunley carried what was known as a spar torpedo. It was basically a canister of explosive powder attached to the end of a long pole, which would be rammed into the opposing ship. On the night of February 17, 1864, The Hunley and its crew slipped into the waters off the coast of Charleston. Powered by hand crank, it glided toward the Housatonic, that explosive payload leading the charge about 20 feet ahead. Later, one of the Housatonic crew members would report that he had seen something strange in the water, something large and mysterious. But before he could alert his crewmates, it was too late. The Hunley jabbed the Housatonic starboard side at about 8.45 p.m. and made history. Those eight men had completed the first successful submarine attack on a warship. Five crew members aboard the Housatonic died as the ship sank, and if the story ended there, that alone would be enough to cement the Hunley's spot in Civil War legend. But there was something else. According to initial reports, everything had gone swimmingly. No pun intended, I swear. The Housatonic had been destroyed and the Hunley had begun its return to base. Except it never made it. The sub and all eight lives inside had been lost, although for almost a century and a half, no one was sure why. The mystery would remain unsolved until the mid-1990s, when the vessel was found at the bottom of Charleston's outer harbor. In the summer of 2000, marine archaeologists raised the Hunley from the depths and got to work restoring the vessel. Experts spent months cleaning up the hull before opening it to see what was inside, And that's when the end of one mystery led to the start of another. You see, the eight crew members hadn't gotten out after the torpedo detonated. A sad end to a daring operation, for sure. But that's not the crazy part. Upon opening up the hull, the conservation experts noticed the crew had never even made any attempt to escape. There were no external injuries or signs of drowning. The explosion, they believe, had simply been so strong that the lung and brain tissue of the men inside had been instantly obliterated. Sometimes you win, and sometimes you lose. And sometimes, apparently, you do both. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. 
I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Stay curious.